Hey, welcome to Radiologist Headquarters. I'm Dr. Dan Koval, and it's time for five cases in five minutes, head and neck imaging number one. I'm going to show each unknown case slide for about 10 seconds and feel free to pause and study the images further. I'll then review the findings, reveal the diagnosis, and move to the next case. Ready? Let's go. Case one, slide one of two, contrast enhanced CT neck. Slide two of two. Okay, so we've got two images of the parotid glands here, and then here's the normal right parotid gland, and then the left parotid gland you can see is enlarged and heterogeneously hyperemic. Also, there's a calculus within the gland, and then you can see that there's some inflammation around the gland as evidenced by the subcutaneous edema and this thickening of the ipsilateral platysma muscle as it abuts the gland. So you've got some parotid gland inflammation. This is known as parotid sialadenitis, and that can be due to bacterial or viral causes, but this stone here in the gland is a clue as to what's causing it in this case. And these cone down images show that indeed there is a stone here within the parotid duct, also known as Stenson's duct. In upstream of that stone, you see a fluid-filled dilated duct with thickened inflamed walls leading to that inflamed parotid gland. So this is left parotid sialadenitis, secondary to an obstructing parotid duct stone, or sialolithiasis. Now let's just discuss the course of the parotid duct. So here's the parotid gland. The duct arises from the anterior aspect of the gland in the parotid space, but then it passes along the surface of the masseter muscle. Here's the left masseter muscle here. There's the right masseter muscle for comparison. At that point, it passes through the buccal space, which is this fat-containing space, and then pierces the buccinator muscle, which is right here. And here's the contralateral buccinator muscle just to compare. And at that point, it opens up at the level of the upper second molar. And then a landmark for the duct is the facial vein, which we have right here. And although you can't see them together on this image, often the zygomaticus muscle will be anterior to the parotid duct. You can see the right zygomaticus muscle here. So the duct will be the second curved line. So if we saw the zygomaticus, it would be here, and the second line would be the parotid duct. And the facial vein will be between these two curved structures, all within the buccal space. So is it more common to have stones in the parotid duct or the submandibular duct? Right, the submandibular duct, and that's because the submandibular duct tends to have increased viscosity of the secretions. Also, it's draining uphill compared to where the gland is and where the duct opens up, so you've got that increased stasis. So it's important, though, to look for parotid duct stones whenever you have inflammation of the parotid gland. All right, case two, slide one of two, MRI of the floor of the mouth. Slide two of two, coronal MRI. So we have axial fat suppressed T2 proton density and T1 postgadolinium images of the floor of the mouth. And notice how there's this lobulated T2 hyperintense, T1 hypointense cystic mass posterior to the right aspect of the mandible and anterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So you might initially think, is this a second branchial cleft cyst given the location? Or could it be a cystic or necrotic lymph node? Well, let's review the floor of the mouth anatomy because it can be a bit confusing. So there are a few muscles to be aware of at the floor of the mouth. So at the midline, you have the genioglossus muscles. Here's the right and left genioglossus. And there it is here on the T2. As you move laterally, you have the hyoglossus muscles on the right and then on the left. And then at the far periphery, you have the mylohyoid muscle, which is like a sling at the floor of the mouth. So between the mylohyoid and the hyoglossus muscles, you have the sublingual space. And that will contain the sublingual glands and ducts. There's the left sublingual space containing the gland and the duct. And this is confusing, but it also has the submandibular duct. Not the gland, though. The submandibular gland is here, and that's within the submandibular space, which will be located inferolateral to the sublingual space. So notice how this lobulated cystic mass actually has a thin communication with the sublingual space, and you see the cystic region here. And also the cystic mass is not enhancing. It has some thin rim enhancement, but this enhancement you see here is the submandibular gland and the sublingual gland, respectively. So this is typical for a ranula which is a retention cyst caused by sublingual gland duct obstruction. And there are two types of ranula. You can have a simple ranula where it's confined to the sublingual space and located above the mylohyoid muscle. So this little one here is actually a simple ranula. It's isolated to the sublingual space. But then the other type is a diving or plunging ranula, which dives inferiorly into the submandibular space, which is below the mylohyoid muscle. So the fact that you see this mass effect by the cystic mass against the submandibular gland, you know that we have to be below the mylohyoid at this level, and it's a diving ranula. And that's confirmed on the coronal images here. This part of the ranula superiorly is within the sublingual space, but then here, inferiorly, we're in the submandibular space, and this is a diving ranula. 
So we don't discreetly see the mylohyoid muscle on these images because of the angle of imaging, but the mylohyoid is kind of a sling or a hammock at the floor of the mouth that will arch this way, superior to the submandibular gland. So even though we can't see it, we can assume it's piercing through the mylohyoid muscle, typical for a diving ranula. So these are typically treated with surgical resection. All right, next case, temporal bone CT scan, history pulsatile tinnitus. All right, so on the left here, we're looking at axial images, and on the right, we're looking at coronal images of the temporal bone. And you can see that there is this ovoid, somewhat lobulated soft tissue mass, which is protruding into the middle ear, and its location is key. You can see this is actually the cochlear promontory, which is the bone overlying the basal turn of the cochlea. And on these coronal images, you can see that it's slightly extending into the inferior aspect of the middle ear, but it's not causing any osseous destruction there at the floor of the middle ear. And with the history of pulsatile tinnitus, this is typical for a glomus tympanicum paraganglioma. So this is the most common middle ear tumor. And the classic appearance is a small mass that occurs on the cochlear promontory. It can increase and fill the entire ear and even engulf the ossicles, but this is the classic appearance. And these tumors arise from the Jacobson nerve, which is a branch of cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve. And again, they most commonly present with pulsatile tinnitus, but they could also present with conductive hearing loss. On clinical examination, they will appear as a vascular retrotympanic mass, and they tend to be slow-growing and non-invasive, and they're usually treated with surgical resection. So there are a couple of differential diagnoses you want to think about when you have a history of a vascular retrotympanic mass, and one of those is an aberrant internal carotid artery. So an aberrant ICA is when you don't have this thin bony covering that separates the carotid canal here from the middle ear. That's known as the tympanic plate. So what happens is the internal carotid artery then spills along the cochlear promontory here, kind of like flowing lava, <laughs> extending into the middle ear. And that's definitely not something you would want to biopsy. So you want to make sure that there's an intact tympanic plate here and that there's not continuous soft tissue extending from the carotid canal to the overlying cochlear promontory region. Another tumor to think about is a glomus jugular tympanicum, a different paraganglioma that will also involve the jugular canal and that will have associated osseous destruction of the floor of the middle ear, which we don't have here. The floor of the middle ear looks intact. And for bonus points, what cranial nerve passes right here? Right, that would be the hypoglossal nerve. And you can see how this looks like an eagle. It's beneath the beak of the eagle here, the hypoglossal canal. All right, case four, name the nasopharyngeal anatomy here. All right, so we're looking at a cone down image of the pharyngeal mucosal space at the level of the nasopharynx. And you can tell we're at the nasopharynx because you have the osseous nasal septum here at the midline. So that's a good clue. Also, you can see the pterygoid plates here bilaterally. So what's this anterior most recess here at the nasopharynx? Well, that's the eustachian tube opening. And just posterior to that is the torus tubarius, which I think is a great name for any pet, just as a suggestion. But this is the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube. And then posterior to that, you have the fossa of Rosenmuller. That's also known as the posterior lateral pharyngeal recess. So why is the fossa of Rosenmuller so important? Well, this is the most common site for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And what can happen is you have a nasopharyngeal carcinoma here. It can cause mass effect against the torus tubarius, which obstructs the eustachian tube opening. And that can give you unilateral mastoid effusion due to fluid backup. So whenever you have a unilateral mastoid effusion in an adult, you want to look closely at the nasopharynx and make sure you're not missing a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And then here are the longest coli muscles. All right, last case, CT neck history of neck pain. Okay, so we're looking at three contrast-enhanced images of the neck here, and we are at the floor of the mouth, but there's nothing going on at the floor of the mouth on this case. Just to quickly review that muscle anatomy, here's the mylohyoid muscle, hyoglossus, and then the genioglossus. But then notice how we've got this fluid here. What space is that in? That's in the retropharyngeal space. And the retropharyngeal space is located posterior to the pharyngeal mucosal space here and anterior to the prevertebral space. And it's anterior to the longus coli muscle. So that tells you that we're in the retropharyngeal space. So we've got a retropharyngeal effusion. So is this an abscess? Well, you don't really see any rim enhancement there. And then also there's another clue to the diagnosis on this lower CT image. And you can see that there's this calcification here anterior to the C1, C2 level in the region of the superior tendons of the longus coli. So this is typical for calcific tendonitis of the longus coli muscle. So this is also known as acute prevertebral calcific tendonitis, and it's an inflammatory condition caused by deposition of calcium hydroxyapatite crystals within the superior tendon fibers of the longus coli muscles. So this can mimic a retropharyngeal abscess, but again, there's no rim enhancement. 
Uh, but it's important to be aware of this because sometimes these patients can have symptoms that might mimic a retropharyngeal abscess like neck pain, fever, odynophagia. They might even have a mildly elevated white blood cell count and ESR levels. But the difference is this is just treated typically with NSAIDs as opposed to surgery. So you should see these pathognomonic calcific densities at that superior longus coli tendon around the C1, C2 level. All right, let's do a rapid review of those five cases. So case one, left parotid sialadenitis, that can be bacterial or viral, or secondary to obstructing parotid duct sialolithiasis, as in this case. And again, that parotid duct opens at the second molar, and it's located posterior to the facial vein and posterior to the zygomaticus muscle. Parotid duct stones are less common than submandibular duct stones. Case two, the diving ranula. That's when you have a retention cyst caused by sublingual gland duct obstruction. It's simple when it's isolated to the sublingual space and diving or plunging when it passes inferior to the sublingual space into the submandibular space below the mylohyoid muscle. So look for that mass effect against the submandibular gland. Again, the sublingual space is located between the mylohyoid and the hyoglossus muscles and contains the sublingual duct, sublingual gland, and the submandibular duct. Case 3, glomus tympanicum paraganglioma classically occurs along the cochlear promontory about the basilar turn of the cochlea, and your main differential diagnosis would be an aberrant internal carotid artery where you would have loss of this tympanic plate and continuation of the aberrant internal carotid artery overlying the cochlear promontory, and also a jugular tympanicum paraganglioma where you would have destruction of the floor of the middle ear. Most common symptom for this is pulsatile tinnitus. Nasopharyngeal anatomy, the eustachian tube opening anteriorly, torus tubarius here, which is the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube, and then the fossa rosamuller, which is the posterior lateral pharyngeal recess and the most common site for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Finally, case 5, calcific tendinitis of the longus coli muscle will have a retropharyngeal effusion located anterior to the longus coli muscles, posterior to the pharyngeal mucosal space, should not have rim enhancement as a retropharyngeal abscess would, and you should have this pathognomonic calcification due to hydroxyapatite crystal deposition in the superior tendon fibers of the longus coli muscles. And this is treated with NSAIDs. All right, that's it for five cases in five minutes, head and neck imaging number one. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture, and if so, please subscribe to Radiologist Headquarters on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. It would be outstanding if you shared these lectures with even just one person or left a podcast review. You can also comment or question on YouTube and visit RadiologistHQ.com for more info and to get updates on social media. Thanks and have a great day.